Okay, so one of my next labs that I actually really like quite a bit, and the students usually like it too, because we get up out of the classroom and go outside for it. Um, it's a way of going about measuring the speed of sound. Now, it's not going to be the best way to go about measuring the speed of sound, so if you want to measure the speed of sound itself pretty accurately, uh, there's another lab that you can do with different sized pipes um, with some software that can pick up the frequency. Basically, it's wave mechanics stuff. Um, this one's a way of measuring the speed of sound using kinematics and more to the point graphical kinematics. So this is my lab that goes along with graphical kinematics. So what we end up doing is you'll need a lot of open space because in short, what I do is I have the students put out at different distances and I take this, which is a magical piece of equipment that is incredibly complicated that we made years ago. It's basically two pieces of wood and we've got them strapped together. That, that's pretty much what it is. But we've got them where they fit pretty nicely. Because what you do, and you'll notice that I put uh, kind of different colored pieces of paper on them to make them easier to see at a distance. You take it like this, and when the students are ready, you walk them through what they need to do. But you slam the boards together, and it makes a very loud noise. Now, one thing to keep in mind that I should probably add in the list of supplies is maybe some ear covers to help protect your hearing. Because whoever's at point blank range kind of hurts. On top of that, with our current setup, with me doing this six times a day, and then a bunch of repeat measurements, as I've mentioned before in other labs, um, my wrists hurt a little bit from the constant impact. So I'm not saying that this is the best thing ever, but uh, you can always try it with smaller amounts or smaller groups or fewer repeats. But if they're far enough away, they'll actually see the boards clap together, so they'll see it, and then a short time later they'll actually hear it. Now, the difference in that is going to be based around the speed of sound. Um, while the speed of light, the thing that's actually letting them see it, is also finite, it's also really, really fast that it's not going to hurt you to kind of assume that it's instant, because um, it's going to be very much a very tiny fraction of a second, so much so that it's nominal. Nominal is a good word for that. Existing in name only. Now, that's where you're going to need some extra space in this. Now, behind our school, we actually have a big field that is used as a practice football field. So we have the football field in the actual small, I don't want to say stadium, but the football field that we have with bleachers and all of that. And then behind that, there's a much bigger field that is bigger than a football uh, stadium. The reason that I bring that up is a lot of people will think, okay, I need space, let's go out to the football field, which isn't a bad one, but your football field is gonna be, I'm not good with sports ball, but roughly 100 yards, so roughly 100 meters, um, with the speed of sound being approximately 340 some odd meters per second, that means it'll get from one side of the football field to the other in about a third of a second, which means it's gonna be hard for reaction times for the students. That's where this can actually come in handy, because the football field is very useful in that you have specific distances marked out. The downside is all of those distances are going to be so close that the students are going to have a hard time actually getting their measurements. Now, as a reminder, if I didn't actually say it, I apologize. The other piece of equipment that you'll need theoretically is stopwatches. Now, feel free to actually save yourself some time and trouble and engage the students a little bit more. Tell them that they're able to use their cell phones. Many of them have timer apps on there, and I can tell you from experience, they're gonna figure out their cell phone app a lot easier than the buttons on, on what is very clearly an ailing stopwatch. But it helps to have a few stopwatches around in case you have students that don't have cell phones or don't wanna use it or anything like that. Um, but what they'll do is when they see the boards clap together, they'll start it, start the stopwatch, and then when they hear the sound, they will stop it and then they'll record that in addition to how far away they are. So, let's get the distances. This, in case you're not familiar with it, is called a trundle wheel. They're usually pretty cheap, you can probably get one for about 10 bucks. Uh, this one isn't state of the art or top of the line or anything like that, but it's, it does the job very well. Um, what I like about these are, particularly this one, it has a diameter such that the circumference around it is one meter and it's got a little pointer here that can tell you how far you've gone. So it makes it really easy. Basically, you walk a dog, more or less, with this. So you go like this, you start it at 100, and then you go the distance you want, and then I've rolled it, looks like 80 centimeters across my, uh, my lab table here. 
Now, we're talking about the distances that I usually use. The first, the shortest distance that I put students out at is about 150 meters. That means it'll take about half a second for, there'll be a half a second difference between when they see the boards clap together and when they hear it. That should be enough that, at least to some extent, they'll be able to notice the difference and they'll be able to actually respond and press the button. Now, every data point that you take is probably still going to be heavily influenced by human reaction speed. And so that's something else that you can bring up and emphasize things like uh, error analysis, sources of error, and ways that they can improve upon it. Okay, so I usually station them at maybe 150 meters, maybe uh, 200 meters, and by the time you're reaching 250, even with this guy, it's going to be kind of hard to, to hear the sound. And so some other recommendations that I've heard are maybe a starter's pistol that you could get online. I might look into that for the future. For the time being, I'm still going with this because it's what I know. It wouldn't hurt for you to have, say, 150 and then maybe 175 and then 200, 225, 250. Try it out, see what you come up with and what works best for you. But it helps to have probably three, if you can, if not more, points where you're actually doing measurements. You can force a data point by assuming that it would be at zero, zero. In other words, if you were right next to the boards clapping together, then your stopwatch difference would be effectively zero, which is one of the things that we've done in the past, but it can help throw off some of your results quite a bit. Now, the nice thing about the trundle wheels, some of them actually have a little counter. I think one of my colleagues has one of those here in the building that I could borrow. But uh, another way that you can do this is there's actually a little, on this one, there's something that you can slide in place. Because if this is only one meter per turn, if you're going 150 meters, that's a lot to keep track of. However, when you slide this into place, it'll click every time you have a complete rotation. So what I do is I actually go out there and I'll roll this and every time I hear a click I go one, two, three, four, and I count my way up to what I need and then when I get to whatever I'm going to, if I get 123 clicks and then this, it's 123 meters and 23 centimeters. And so it's a decent way of getting long distances without having too much hassle. Um, you can also use tape measures, but again, the distances that you're going to need are going to be kind of big on this. Now, actually interpreting the data, what you'll have them do is you'll have a distance versus time graph. So you would have for your Y coordinate, that would be your distance, you'd want them to keep track of how far out they were. So if they were at the first spot, 150 meters, they would have a data point that's 150 meters, and it would be about half a second if they have really good reaction times, right? And so their time, it would be 150 meters and then comma 0.5 seconds and then maybe 200 meters and 0.7 seconds something like that and then have them graph those out what i do actually and this gets back to that repeat measurements is i have them move from place to place so i have uh, a third of the class at one distance and i do this and then i do it nine more times well, whatever distance they're at, I actually do this a total of 10 times so that they can average. Because again, this one is going to be heavily impacted by their reaction time. And then I have a, a system set up where I lift this up or some other flag and I spin it around, letting them know that they need to switch locations and they'll go to the next one. So getting some long range communication is nice too. If you have walkie talkies, go for it. But you, most of the stuff that you need is pretty simple. Just have them set up where uh, they know to move from one place to the other. You don't have to do that, depending on your time limitations or other things. You can have the students, maybe one group that's at 150, and their job is to collect that data. And then the next one's at 200, and then 250, and then all those groups get together, and then they share their data. Though it helps if you have it where each individual student is doing each different distance because most likely their reaction time is going to be kind of a constant in that. And you can also start going through with their results and look at, oh, um, judging by if they're above or below or what the slope is, you can actually make some interpretation of what their reaction times are. If they're much more aligned to audio stimulus or visual stimulus, that sort of thing. Anyway, um, back to the important point. So by the time they're done, they usually have, for me, 
10 different times at 150 meters, at 200 meters, at 250 meters. I have them average those just to get a good mid-range value for at 150 meters, the average of my 10 data points is 0 0.7 seconds or something like that. And then have them do it for each one, then have them graph that the average points for your distance versus your time. And so that gets us back to the classic thing in physics where the slope of a distance versus time graph is your velocity. Now it's also nice if you can have four or five different data points because then you should end up with a roughly straight line. You can even talk to the students about, hey, maybe we don't know for certain that the speed of sound is constant. But if you don't see a curvature in there, then you have a constant acceleration. You can talk about the nature of the graphs. Um, the first year I did this, I collected all the students' data and I ran some of the numbers up myself. I had them generate a graph as well, but I didn't want to, and I didn't have enough time to invest as much as I'd like, and I don't think they got as much out of it. But um, I found that even with the reaction time, the percentages were, I think they, they were usually consistently about 15% above the accepted value, but even still it's something where most of the students are going to know, yeah, it's kind of hard to get that because it happens so quickly. But they will actually see the difference between they see it go together and then they hear it sometime after. And so that's another thing that's really good to get across. But it's one, it's a way to bring in graphical kinematics and some, something fun where they get to go outside. My students always love labs that are outside. And so it also doesn't require a whole lot of equipment. One of the other things that I will bring up, and this is one that you can leave to your students to figure out, ask them ways that they can cut down on that error. So one of the ones that I have, and I'll try and post the video for it as well, I've done this again with this very camera actually set up with me doing it, and I do a video of it to get that difference, and then with the distances involved and all of that, I can go through and actually with some video editing, I can use that video to remove human error in the reaction time because I can just use the timestamps on the video between when you see the boards clap together and when the sound actually occurs to get the exact, at least so far as the camera is capable of, time difference between those. When I did that, I ended up, I think, less than 1% off of the value for the speed of sound. So that's something else that you could conceivably do, especially with technology. I'd imagine you have a point and click camera like the one I'm currently using or um, the students can do it with their cell phones too. Although it does take a lot of time and effort and a little bit of familiarity with using editing software. And so, but other things to bring up. And then also, again, future projects, even if you don't end up doing them, have them come up with ways using technology that they could cut down on human error. But that's yet another one of the labs that I like.